Okay, as you can see, I already started and I messed up, so I have to repeat it, but yeah. Um, I p pick up where we left off. We try to talk about the possibility of synthetic a priori knowledge. Uh, we first have to give technical definitions. I did a conceptual analysis with the concept of knowledge and the concept of proposition because this uh, concept of proposition is embedded in the concept of knowledge via the concept belief. Um, and now I want to talk about the distinction in the class of propositions. Um, and this is the distinction between a priori versus a posteriori propositions, okay? Um, yeah, this can be a little bit intimidating, just like the technical talk and the way these uh, words sound, but you shouldn't be intimidated by that. It's just like, yeah, you can give them different names if you like, so as long as you are as you're referring to the phenomenon, it's okay. So let's talk about this distinction in the class of propositions. We can also talk about categories and propositions, of course, and we can give a preliminary definition. It's a little bit vague, but I think it's a good starting point. Um, and I'll be very formal, very like precise uh, with these definitions now because uh, it's a very tricky subject and there are several misunderstandings which make the discussions uh, needlessly um, complicated. Okay, let's start. A proposition P expressed by sentence S, believed by person S at time T to be true, I could say, is an a priori proposition. Okay, so here a priori proposition, the thing we want to define, if and only if P truth or falsehood can be known independently of experience. Okay, now we substitute the concept of knowledge that we already explicated. A proposition P, blah, 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 is an a priori proposition if only P can be, can be justified as a, the belief that P, that P is the case, that the interior angles of a right triangle uh, sum up to 180 degrees, for example, um, this proposition P can be justified without referring to experience, either our everyday experience, the experience we make in the, within the manifest image, as Seller would put it, or our scientifically and thereby empirically enriched understanding of the empirical world. So, when, so I, I mean that uh, most trees have uh, green leaves, for example, to give a trivial example, just because I, I am a conscious being and I have certain like convictions about the world, and these experience I just made myself, okay? Of course, we also have like, we've also referred to experience in a very sophisticated way using the natural sciences. Um, and this is also a way of referring to experience. This is a distinction I wanted to make. It's an obvious distinction, but I think you should have in mind that it's different. So let's elaborate. Uh, on this a little bit because I know it's complicated. This is standard misunderstanding. The explication given is what is called the justificatory analysis of a priori propositions or a priori knowledge. Um, and the, the, this misunderstanding, the standard misunderstanding, relies on a conceptual analysis of a priori which somehow uses like a um, the concept of time. So if we go back to it, uh, can be known independently of experience. And the problem with this definition is that this independently is a very vague and ambiguous term. Yeah, Independently, you can understand independently in the definition given above, either in a justific justificatory sense. And this is the sense I explicated right here, just like okay, it can be known a priori simply means uh, that by, if you, tr if you would try to justify this proposition, you need not refer to um, the empirical world, to experiences in any way. For example, if I want to justify uh, the, the, the center, the proposition that all, that uh, all bachelors are unmarried, I can just say, yeah, that's a priori true. I don't have to refer to experience because a bachelor just means unmarried men. And, um, um, and saying all unmarried men are unmarried is trivial, <laughs> but it's also a priori true. I don't have to do an a, a empirical investigation into the question whether all bachelors are un unmarried men. That's an absurd, uh, that's an absurd uh, investigation. Okay, this is the justificatory sense that I just gave. And now there is the, the fallacious understanding understanding of the concept a priori uh, propositions or knowledge 
I talk about a priori propositions and not knowledge because the concept of proposition is contained. So we read, we should have a concept of a priori propositions before we talk about a priori knowledge, since it is a more complicated notion. Um, um, the, and in that sense, the independently gets interpreted as before any experience. Yeah? And this before is still a metaphor. It's still so vague that you can't really understand what is meant by it. Uh, because there is no, as a human being, there is no point before any experience. So uh, we come into the world and we make experiences. Okay. Uh, even if you assume that the uh, human baby is like a tabula rasa, like meaning that there is nothing, no inherent structure to the baby's mind, and this the structure just uh, arises by by the experiences, the empirical experiences the child makes. Even if you believe that, which is simply not true, um, there is no point before any experience. Um, and for example, mathematical propositions. I mean, I have a like weird intuitive grasp of what they mean, but it's so vague and so uh, wrong in so many sense that I have trouble even explicating it, yeah, right? But the idea is so a little bit like before any possible uh, experience I could have, I could know this to be true, something like that. Uh, I don't want to <laughs> uh, talk about this uh, anymore just because this misunderstanding has uh, had great uh, and very tedious uh, implications in the philosophy and history of philosophy because this concept of a priori is just like a bad concept that can that any empiricist can destroy very easily so yeah so this is something you have to have in mind because many empiricist criticisms of like the rationalists or Kant or uh, rely on this uh, false uh, and unfortunately standard misunderstanding of the ge genetic a priori. We call this the, this misunderstanding uh, in a genetic sense and genetic not in the biological sense, but uh, concerning genesis, how something comes into being. But it, it doesn't matter. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So just uh, um, Delete it and think back to our definition. So, okay. A proposition P believed by a person S at time T is an a proposition if P can be justified without referring to experience. Um, can be known independently of experience, but this independently in the justificatory sense. So I think this is a pretty good definition, but as always, we need to have examples to have a better grasp on what we talk about. We can, for example, say, and I'll give very standard examples now, the sum of a, the sum of the interior angles of a right triangle sum up to 180 degrees. Okay, this is a mathematical proposition meaning this is a proposition that uh, we uh, uh, contemplate when we do mathematical investigations. Um, and obviously, when we now think about a proposition uh, of our definition of, analys of uh, analytic, um, we know this to be an a priori statement because of course, I can draw an angle, uh, a right angle, a right triangle uh, on my board, for example, and measure um, the interior angles. And every time I do this, I end up um, getting 180 degrees. Um, but this is not a mathematical proof, right? This is you would be left at if you think this is a mathematical proof because it's not general. Um, without any, um, um, you without any reference to experience, you can deduce this, um, just as you can deduce many mathematical propositions. Uh, that two parallel lines will never intersect or stuff like that in a Euclidean space. Um, so mathematical propositions are the best and the most beautiful example of a priori propositions because they are so clearly a priori. If you claim that mathematics is an empirical science and you simply don't understand what mathematics is, it's, it's that simple. And mathematics is also the reason why we still have this discussion, because um, outside of mathematics is very 
hard to um, um, try to like um, defend the possibility of a priori knowledge in general. But mathematics is such a clear and shining example of a priori knowledge um, that uh, the question of a prioricity is still very, very interesting one up to this day. So uh, I can give you other example. The other example uh, is all bachelors are unmarried. And this is also a priori. Uh, and it's a priori in a special way. And I'll talk about this in the upcoming video. It's uh, because it's analytic. Analytic. And by that, I roughly mean true, true by definition of the terms of the terms that are contained in the sentence. Um, so if we know, we, uh, we have like, a, um, a linguistic, I call it linguistic knowledge, it's not the best the term, but stick with me. Um, uh, bachelor means unmarried man. Then we substitute. Then we have all unmarried men are unmarried. This is a tautology. In the end it's saying for all A, A equals A. <laughs> um, and it's trivially true by, by substitution. Okay. Um, this is called what we could call the linguistic a priori, the conceptual a priori is a better, better way of putting it. And what we are doing right now is more or less this. This, of course, is a silly example because it's so simple. Yeah. Um, but let's first ask ourselves, is, is this a priori? It's clearly a priori. Imagine a person trying to investigate empirically whether all unmarried men are unmarried. Uh, at this point, you will like uh, <laughs> doubt if this is a person is mentally competent. Um, so yeah, this is the conceptual a priori. And this is a very easy example, a very uh, boring example in a way. But imagine that our concepts are very, very complicated, as I demonstrate by what we're doing right now, right? So you can, you can see like these substitutions are not uh, as easy as it might seem giving the simple example. And the if you think about explicating a concept as a tree and you start in the root node and every other edge is like the concept contained in it, it can be very complicated. And this is uh, the realm of, um, of conceptual complexity, one could say. So we shouldn't disregard an a priori uh, proposition, proposition with it, which is true because it's analytic as somehow boring. This is a mistake many people do, many people make, I'm sorry. Um, so I think you should know now what an actual proposition is. So let's think about what an but what is an a posteriori proposition. And this is simple. It's and this is also a nice way of doing conceptual analysis by if you have a distinction, uh, just define the other term by negation. And then, then you have a formal, neat way of organizing your thoughts. It's a proposition that is not a priori. And that, that means it is, <clears throat> it's come, it's, we can copy this uh, definition, uh, piece. Peace, uh, truth, or falsehood can be known, can not be known independently of experience. <coughs> and by independently, I mean in the justificatory, in the we could also call this the normative sense. That's maybe a better way of putting it. Um, because the genetic sense is just a, in a weird way descriptive. And then even in that sense, just a really bad explication of the concept of a priori. Um, as though what we mean by this in the end is an a, pro <coughs> a posteriori proposition is a proposition 
that's tr and uh, the truth or falsehood of this proposition cannot be known independently of experience and by meaning that if we try to justify this proposition right we have to refer to <clears throat> everyday experience or uh, the empirical sciences or something like that and this is what we call an a posterior proposition and as you might have guessed this class of a posterior propositions is magnitudes bigger than the a, pro pro a priori propositions <clears throat> Uh, wait a minute, this might not even be the case because there are uncountably infinite a priori propositions in mathematics. But, um, okay, we don't need to talk about this. Um, yeah, I can give you examples, but this is uh, trivial. Uh, for example, the average dog weighs 15 kilograms. Uh, this may be true, this may be false, but it's most definitely a, a posterior proposition. Um, also, um, the speed of light is, um, yeah, try to say roughly, but then the truth conditions become a little bit weird, is, we can give it a try, what is it, the speed of light is uh, this number right here. Um, yeah, these are simple empirical propositions. We can also call, or call them empirical propositions. Okay, and by this I will end it. We are at 16 minutes already. I hope you find this still interesting. I know it's a, a little bit involved, but that's philosophy. Um, in the next video, I will talk about the difference between a synthetic and an analytic proposition. Thank you very much for listening and see you then. Bye-bye.